<clears throat> thank you very much, Wuhan, and thank all of you. It's always wonderful to be here at Music at Menlo, this wonderful festival, and to see all of you again. And I'd like to welcome you to this encounter, which is called Classical Twilight. And as Wuhan said, this is intended to set the stage for tomorrow evening and Sunday afternoon's concerts, which will feature two diametrically opposed masterpieces from the 1820s. On the first half, Beethoven's valedictory string quartet in F major, opus 135, and on the second half, Schubert's Winterreise, The Winter Journey. And although these two pieces were composed within about a year of each other, they could not be more different in terms of their, their atmosphere, their ambiance, their style, their substance, and particularly in terms of their emotional and spiritual worlds. Opus 135 was completed in October of 1826, Beethoven was 55 at the time, and he had about five months to go in his life. And it's quite different from the other late quartets that he wrote, the other four, because Opus 135 doesn't really go off into the outer realms of the known musical and spiritual universe. It stays closer to home. It's, it's more earthy, it's more genial in its style, it's formally more traditional. And perhaps most unusually, the last movement is preceded by this epigraph that he himself wrote into the score, the resolution reached with difficulty. And this resolution seems to have something to do with the nature of fate, the nature of destiny. And he asks this question in musical terms, must it be? And then he answers that question in the unequivocal affirmative. And this very positive, joyous response forms the spiritual and also the motivic basis for the entire piece. The first, the third, and the fourth movements are all based on this little tunelet that we just heard. Winterreise was completed a year later, in October of 1827 by this still very young composer. Schubert was 30 years old. And the piece itself, as I said, is completely the opposite in its atmosphere, in its tone than Opus 135. It consists of 70 minutes of wandering across this grim, frozen landscape of the soul. And the composer, though 30 years old, was aware of the fact that he had already entered the final chapter of his life because for the previous four years, he had been suffering from syphilis, which in those pre-antibiotic days was really tantamount to a death sentence. There was really no way that you could treat it. There were medications that they employed which were laced with mercury sometimes or with arsenic, and they were as bad for you as the disease. And so he was, at this point in his life, engaged in writing one profound exploratory masterpiece after another, as he aimed higher and higher, ascending to the Olympian heights that had only recently been vacated by Beethoven himself. So to give you a sense of what to expect this evening, this encounter will be divided into two parts. I won't call them halves, because the first part is about 30 minutes long, the second about twice that. And in the first part, we will talk about what we know of the relationship between Schubert and Beethoven, both personally and musically. And then we'll take a break. And when we come back, we will talk about Winterreise. We'll talk a bit about the history of the piece. We will talk about the poet, Wilhelm Müller. But the bulk of the second half will, as Wuhan said, be involved in raising the hood on six of the songs from the 24-song cycle. And I hope that by doing that, it will give us all some understanding of why these rather melancholy, somewhat gloomy songs form such a culmination of Schubert's late art. Although Schubert and Beethoven lived for more than 30 years simultaneously in this not particularly large town of Vienna, 
And although they died about a year and a half apart from each other, there is no persuasive evidence that they actually ever had a private conversation with each other, which on the surface of it seems very peculiar. There are various reports of them being in the same place at the same time, and we get this idea that they knew each other in some peripheral way. There's a report, for instance, from Schubert's older brother, Ferdinand. He said, Schubert and Beethoven met frequently, although Franz could not be called Beethoven's pupil, as has often been done. But he doesn't tell us where these supposedly frequent meetings took place, if he actually saw Beethoven and Schubert speaking together. He just leaves that vague. And there's a similarly vague statement from this gentleman, Anselm Huttenbrenner, who was a friend of Schubert. He was also a young composer, three years older than Schubert. He lived in Vienna for three years, from 1815 until 1818. He came from Graz, Austria. And as you see from this picture, they were very good friends. And he also knew Beethoven, and he is one of the two people who were verifi verifiably present at Beethoven's death. And we know that because he took a lock of Beethoven's hair, and it has since taken up residence in Graz, Austria, in a museum. And he described Beethoven and Schubert being in the same place at the same time in these terms. He said, Beethoven used to go to the publishing house of Steiner and Company two or three times a week. There was almost always a gathering of composers there and an exchange of musical opinions. Schubert used to accompany me there. We delighted in Beethoven's pithy and sometimes sarcastic remarks, especially on the subject of Italian music. But again, we remember that Anselm Huttenbrenner only lived in Vienna really consistently from 1815 until 1818, which means that Schubert would have been in his late teens and Beethoven in his late 40s. And he basically gives you the sense that they sat there and they listened to Beethoven hold forth. There are also unverified accounts of a purported visit by Schubert to Beethoven on his deathbed. Again, vague, unsupported. We don't know if it's true. And weighing rather heavily on the other side of the equation, we have a rather definitive statement from this gentleman, Joseph von Spaun, who was a very close friend of Schubert. He was a wealthy young nobleman who sponsored many of these gatherings that became known as Schubertiata, where Schubert's music was, was performed for his circle of friends. And he is one of the people that we regard as one of Schubert's most reliable posthumous reporters. And he wrote this. Schubert often lamented, and especially at the time of Beethoven's death, how much he regretted that the latter had been so inaccessible and that he had never spoken to Beethoven. Schubert would have considered himself fortunate to be possible for him to approach Beethoven. But during the last years of his life, the latter was quite unbalanced and unapproachable. And given what we know about Beethoven in the last years of his life, this has the ring of truth. And also, we remember that living there in this small musical society there in Vienna, they had many musical associates in common, patrons, publishers, performers who knew them. And yet, of all these people, we don't have any correspondence or personal diary entries that would indicate that people had seen Beethoven and Schubert closeted together having some kind of an intense conversation. And so again, I think we have to take Spaun at his word that they, according to Schubert, never spoke. The question is, why not? And as we see in this caricature from the time, you know, Beethoven in his late 40s and onward was more and more profoundly deaf and also more and more cantankerous and irascible and as Spaun put it, unapproachable. And as we see in this caricature from the time, Schubert was notoriously shy and introverted, not a good self-promoter. Um, and we understand that Schubert was growing up in what was by that time Beethoven's Vienna. Beethoven was, by the early years of the 19th century, 
the musical peak. He was casting this long shadow over musical society there. And so by most accounts, Schubert, as he grew up in Vienna, regarded Beethoven as his musical idol and his musical role model. And yet, there is a notorious diary entry that he wrote in 1816, which is often cited as evidence of his purported hostility toward Beethoven and his music when he, Schubert, was still in his teens. And I'll read it for you in just a minute, but I'll set the, the stage for it. It was written on the evening of June the 16th, 1816, in the wake of a celebratory jubilee on behalf of Antonio Salieri, who was celebrating the 50th anniversary of his arrival in Vienna in June of 1766. And since that time, he had risen to become the imperial court Kapellmeister. He was a highly respected composer and a music director, and also a highly respected teacher. And he had mentored many of the young composers growing up there in Vienna during the early 19th century, Schubert included. And everybody came to this party, and many of them had pieces of music that they had written specifically for the event to honor Salieri, Schubert included. Schubert wrote a celebratory cantata, about five minutes long, and he based it on his own fawning poem in which he referred to Salieri as a god in their midst and a guardian angel looking down on them. I'll play you a bit of the second movement, which I'm sure that Schubert must have written to sing himself at the event. It's lovely, tender, sentimental music. And at the end of this short cantata, he wrote a chorus in canonic style that everybody there who had come could sing together to celebrate Salieri and his grandfatherly presence in their lives. <laughs> It's quite a different portrait than the one that comes down to us from Peter Schaefer and Amadeus. I will speak for you, Father. I speak for all mediocrities in the world. <laughs> I am their champion. I am their patron saint. <laughs> and I suspect that the truth about Salieri's personality lies somewhere between these Schubertian and Schaeferian extremes. <laughs> in any event, Schubert came home from this party that night, intoxicated by this warm aura of collegiality and probably also by the many toasts that had been imbibed on Salieri's behalf. And here's what he wrote. It must be beautiful and refreshing for an artist to see all of his pupils gathered around him each one striving to give his best for his jubilee, and to hear in all of these compositions the expression of pure nature, free from the bizarreness that is common among most composers nowadays and is due almost wholly to one of our greatest German artists. That bizarreness that joins and confuses the comic with the tragic, the agreeable with the repulsive, Heroism with howlings, the holiest with harlequinades without distinction. So as to goad people to madness instead of dissolving them in love, to incite them to laughter instead of lifting them up to God. And most commentators agree that this greatest of German artists he was referring to was Beethoven. And it is a rather hostile paragraph, and it really makes you wonder what was the background of this statement, what made him lash out at Beethoven in such a way. And I was curious to know, and I read an illuminating article in a musicological journal by uh, Christopher Gibbs, a great Schubert scholar who is a laureate here of this encounter series as well. 
And he strove to set the context and to remind us that Schubert in his teens was constantly in flux. He was eclectic in his influences. And sometimes he was influenced by Italian composers like Salieri, and particularly by Rossini in that year of 1816, because that was the year that Rossini's Barber of Seville was premiered in Vienna, and everybody was walking the streets singing the tunes, Schubert included. And we can see evidence of his Rossini philia uh, reflected in the Rondo theme from the fourth movement of his sixth symphony, which he wrote just about that time. which to me sounds like Gioacchino Schuberto. <laughs> and we have to remember <clears throat> that at this exact time, he was also undergoing an infatuation with late classicism from the late 18th century as embodied by Mozart in his music. As a matter of fact, three days before he wrote that nasty blast at Beethoven in his diary, he wrote this fawning tribute to Mozart. He said, oh, Mozart, Immortal Mozart, how endlessly many comforting perceptions of a brighter and better life have you brought to our souls. And three months earlier in March of 1816, he wrote his sonatina in D major for violin and piano, which sounds like this. sounds like Wolfgang Amadeus Schubert. <laughs> and also, I think, true to Schaeffer's portrait in Amadeus of Salieri, he was 66 at this time, and he really was becoming concerned and piqued over the fact that his music was going out of fashion, that he was soon to be deleted from the catalog. He was irked by that, didn't like seeing music heading off into uncharted Beethovenian waters, and he wrote, I realized that musical taste was gradually changing in a manner completely contrary to that of my own times. Eccentricity and confusion of genres replaced reasoned and masterful simplicity. So I think it's rather easy setting the context with all of that to imagine young Schubert staggering home from this celebratory jubilee on Salieri's behalf and writing this blast at Beethoven, perhaps even mouthing words similar to the words that Salieri had spoken earlier that very evening, because Salieri, we have to remember, was also the teacher of Beethoven not long after he came to live in Vienna in the early 1790s, and Beethoven was conspicuously absent from this jubilee. So perhaps feeling dissed, he may have said some nasty things that Schubert decided to copy into his diary. We don't know. But what we do know is this nasty blast that Beethoven aside all other primary and secondary sources seem to agree that growing up in Beethoven's Vienna, Beethoven was really Schubert's idol, both musically and also professionally. And we can tell that too in the music that he wrote at this time. If we go back to the Sixth Symphony, I'll play you the beginning of the C major scherzo. And here's the beginning of the C major scherzo from Beethoven's first symphony. It sounds almost like the same piece. Also, six years later in 1822, Schubert made his reverence for Beethoven plain for all of the world to see. When he dedicated his forehand piano piece, opus, these are variations, opus 10, to Ludwig van Beethoven from his worshiper and admirer, Franz Schubert. And when he was done, and when they gave him an advanced copy, he decided to go across town to Beethoven's home and to present it to the master himself. And he knocked on the door, and apparently a servant answered and said Beethoven was out for the day. 
So he left it with the servant and he fled. And apparently, uh, Beethoven appreciated the gesture and he liked to read it occasionally with his nephew, Carl. And this begs a final question here, which is what did Beethoven think of Schubert's music and to what extent was he even aware of it? And, you know, I should preface this by saying that Beethoven was not exactly charitable towards his younger contemporaries, the composers of the day. He very rarely would praise anybody without reservation who was younger than he was. And yet, although he was deaf, he was completely aware of all the trends, musically speaking, there going on in Vienna because he read music, of course, but he also read the papers, he read the musicological journals, he saw the advertisements, and he would certainly have been aware of the fact that the year before, in 1821, Schubert had scored an enormous success with the publication of Earl Koenig, which he had written at the age of 15, but was finally published, and it created a great furor there in, in Vienna. And I'm sure that Beethoven would have known about that. And as a matter of fact, reports got down to Schubert from his own personal secretary, a gentleman named Joseph Hutenbrenner, who was the brother of Anselm, uh, that Beethoven had said some nice things about his early songs. Perhaps that's what precipitated him making that nice dedication to Beethoven. And also, this gentleman, Anton Schindler, he was Beethoven's personal secretary towards the end of his life. And he's not a very reliable source because a lot of what he wrote about his dealings with Beethoven was very self-serving. But he did say that towards the end of Beethoven's life, when Beethoven was on his deathbed, he brought a set of songs that Schubert had written, still in manuscript, about 60 of them over to Beethoven for him to examine. And he reported on Beethoven's response. He said, the great master who had not known more than five songs of Schubert's before was astonished at their number and would not believe that Schubert had composed more than 500 already. But if he was surprised by their number, he was filled with utmost astonishment by their merits. For several days, he could not tear himself away from them. He cried out several times with joyful enthusiasm, there is truly a divine spark in Schubert. Now, given the lack of trustworthiness of this gentleman, we do not know if that's true in part, in portion, or not at all. But in a sense, it, it has the ring of truth. Because if Beethoven knew any of Schubert's music, it would have been his songs. Schubert was not known for his symphonic music during his lifetime because none of it was published during his lifetime. None of his symphonies were published. And so he wouldn't have been able to really hear that or examine the scores. He may have known some of Schubert's late chamber music, or at least heard positive reports from this gentleman, Ignaz Schupanzig, who was a musical avant-garde advocate of the day. He was the first violinist of the so-called Schupanzig String Quartet, which at one point had been the Razumovsky Quartet. And he had premiered almost all of Beethoven's string quartets. And he had his own concert series, and he would play the music of younger composers as well as Beethoven, Schubert among them, and he did play Schubert's last couple of string quartets. And he also played, and seems to have liked a lot, Schubert's 50-minute octet, which Schubert had modeled after Beethoven's early popular septet for virtually the same combination of instruments. And we know that he liked it because after Beethoven died in March of 1827, about three weeks later, about Easter time, Schupanzig had a memorial concert, a chamber music concert for Beethoven, which of course featured a lot of music that Beethoven had written. But he started that concert with the 50-minute Schubert octet, which tells you, I think, something about the status that Schubert's music was attaining at the end of Beethoven's life and at the end of his own life. And as for Schubert's own tributes to Beethoven, we know that he was one of the torchbearers at this large public funeral that took place at the end of March for Beethoven in 1827. And we also know that exactly one year after Beethoven died, on March the 26th, 1828, Schubert had his one and only public concert of his own music there in Vienna. He and his friends rented out the Musikverein, and they had this long, complicated, 
program in his behalf. And the fact that they chose to do it on the first anniversary of Beethoven's death tells us both that they were honoring Beethoven, of course, but also that they were saying our friend Schubert is now the rightful successor to the name of greatest living composer here in Vienna. And in this long program, it started with one of those late string quartets, although from this program it's a little hard to tell which one it was. Fourth on the program was the, the great 50-minute E-flat major piano trio. We know it as Opus 100 now. Second, there was a group of songs, six of them, some of them still popular today, Der Wanderer, Stenschen. Last on the program, there was a piece for male choir and piano so that Schubert could presumably accompany all of his friends who'd rented out the hall for him that day. But there was only one piece on this very long program that was written specifically for this event, and that was the fifth piece on the program, this song, Auf dem Strom, On the River. He set a poem by Ludwig Rellstab, who was a Berlin-based critic and poet. And Rellstab had written this poem specifically in the hope that Beethoven would set it to music. And he sent it down to Vienna, and Beethoven died before he had an opportunity to set it to music, or perhaps he didn't even look at it. In any event, it was tossed onto a pile of Beethoven's papers and remained there until later in the season when Anton Schindler allowed Franz Schubert to range around in Beethoven's Beethoven's papers, and he unearthed this poem. And as he read it, he said this would be the perfect way to commemorate Beethoven on the first anniversary of his death. And by this time, Schubert had written almost 600 songs. I mean, and he knew everything that there was to write about, you know, setting poetry to music. He wrote poetry himself. He had grown up around poets and poetry. And at a glance, he could see all of the metaphors and metaphysical properties of a poem. And I think in this poem, he saw in this nameless boatman heading down the river a metaphor for Beethoven heading down the river of life and out into the wider ocean of immortality. And I assume that many of you know this. It's been played here. It was done a few seasons ago during the Schubert uh, year here. And it's distinguished by the fact that it has a French horn solo. It makes it completely unique in Beethoven's songs. And so each of the pre-verse prelude and interludes are for French horn and piano. So for instance, the second interlude, or the first interlude after the first verse, conjures up this image of this unnamed boatman sailing down this unnamed river over this tranquil E major stream of triplets in the left hand of the piano. And about three bars later, Schubert himself sort of turns the harmonic tiller just a little bit to send us cascading out of this E major tranquility into the turbulence of C sharp minor. tells us subliminally that we're heading into troubled waters. And from this point, this tranquil stream of triplets erupts into full-handed C-sharp minor chords trembling away in both hands of the piano part. And if this music sounds vaguely familiar to you, it should, because it's the moment in which Schubert is informing us subliminally that this unnamed boatman heading down the river is in fact Beethoven because the music we just heard is a clear allusion to the beginning of the funeral march from Beethoven's Eroica Symphony. And we remember that Beethoven dedicated the Eroica Symphony to the memory of a great man. And so by making this musical allusion, 
Schubert is turning that dedication back onto Beethoven himself. Sadly, about five months after he had this very successful debut performance there in Vienna, Schubert himself lay dying in his brother's home on the outskirts of Vienna. And one of his last requests was to a mutual friend of Beethoven's and his, a violinist named Karl Holtz, who had played second violin in the Schupanzig String Quartet. He had played all of Beethoven's late string quartets. And the penultimate string quartet in C-sharp minor had not been performed. It was not to be published for another eight years. It was just regarded as too avant-garde. Nobody knew what to make of it. But Schubert himself had heard about the piece and was curious to hear it. And so he asked Holtz if he would take a group of string players to his bedchamber there and to play it for him. And when they were finished doing it, he described Schubert's response. He said, Schubert fell into such a state of excitement and enthusiasm that we were all frightened for him. Schubert's comment at the completion of the performance was, after this, what is there left for us to write? And Holtz went on to say, the quartet was the last music he heard. The king of harmony has sent the king of song friendly bidding to the crossing. And I take it to mean that the king of harmony, Beethoven, had somehow managed to reach out from beyond the grave through the medium of this penultimate string quartet to guide Schubert, the king of song, across the mortal divide. And it's an interesting comment in light of what Schubert accomplished in Auf dem Strom, which was to guide Schubert across that same mortal divide and out into eternity. And as one final example of Schubert's lifelong and unto death reverence for Beethoven, a couple of days after Schubert died, his brother Ferdinand wrote a note to their father and he said, on the evening before his death, though only half conscious, he said to me, I implore you to transfer me to my room, not to leave me here in this corner of the earth. Do I then deserve no place above the earth? I answered him, dear Franz, rest assured, believe me, your brother Ferdinand, whom you have always trusted and who loves you so much, you are in your room where you have always been and lie in your bed. But Franz said, no, it is not true. Beethoven does not lie here. Is this not an index of his heartfelt wish to rest by the side of Beethoven, whom he so deeply reverenced? And in the end, Schubert got his dying wish, and his remains now lie across from Beethoven's in the Vienna Central Cemetery. So I think it's a good time to take a break. We can go out and breathe the summer air for a few minutes before we come back in and take our winter journey. <laughs>